Thank you so much, Guy. Uh, the hospitality here has just been wonderful. So it's been a, a lovely time on a lovely campus. I want to thank Guy and all the folks who volunteered to put this event together. I really appreciate it. We've had a, we've had a great time. And before, I, I just have a few remarks before we get to the questions. And, uh, um, but one thing I'll straighten out, Guy mentioned the Time 100 list. You know, they have this Time 100 most influential people in the world list, which I made last year, which was quite a surprise. Thank you very much. Which was a bit of a, a shock, as you might imagine. We thought it was an April Fool's Day joke. And I'm one of seven kids. I'm from a big Catholic family in Seattle, Washington. In my family, there's six boys and one, one sister. And uh, I got a phone call from one of my older brothers when this list came out. And he said, uh, Bob, uh, you making the Time 100 list is quite a promotion because you're not even the most influential person in our family. That was a, <laughs> so so he, the person he was referring to, to who that was is my one sister. That's my sister Anne. And she's here with me today, my sister Anne. So please welcome my sister Anne, who's here from Seattle as well. So we, we've, had a, we've had a great visit. Um, we spent some time in London, uh, went to the theater, uh, went to some shows, and then up here. And so uh, this trip is a little different than last year. I came to England with three college buddies. And uh, in eight days, we went and traveled around uh, England to see uh, six English Premier League football matches. So, so this trip was a bit more refined than last year's, than last year's trip. So I did promise my buddies uh, that uh, we came with the intention of seeing these football matches, but also to adopt an English Premier League football team. That was our, our goal for doing this trip. And so the team we adopted, uh, the Bournemouth Cherries, a bit obscure, the Bournemouth Cherries. And so I promised my buddies that I would uh, give a shout out to Eddie Howe, the manager. And we're going to have a request to Eddie Howe to welcome us to Bournemouth next year. We're going to make another trip back. We want to go to Bournemouth and see his team play. So if he's watching, we want to come see him. So uh, thanks again for having me. And uh, what I'm going to do is just have a few comments about, you know, a bit about the aid, the role of the Attorney General in Washington State litigation we have against the Trump administration. And just to give you a sense, since Donald Trump's been elected president, my office, for example, has filed 26 lawsuits against the Trump administration. That's a lot of litigation in just a little over a year. And uh, so far, I think it's worth pointing out that six of those cases have been decided. There's no more appeals. Like the first travel ban case that was mentioned, there's no more appeals, the cases are over. We won all six of those cases, or six known in those cases. Three more cases have had decisions from a federal trial court judge, but could be appealed or are appealed. We've won all three of those cases. In other words, so far, not a single federal judge, whether appointed by a Republican president or a Democratic president, has ruled against us in any of these challenges. And so I'm often asked, well, Bob, hey, how come you're filing so many lawsuits against the president? What I often say is, well, hey, how come the president keeps issuing executive orders that are unconstitutional or unlawful? That's where the question should be, put on the administration. Their job is to uh, enact laws and, and rules that are lawful, that follow our constitution, and they continue not to do it. One thing I'll say is that, and we'll probably get to this in the Q&A, is that all of these cases are very important for the legal issues they raise. They're very important for the people who are impacted. We were talking upstairs about the travel ban. And people from my home state of Washington, for example, students at our universities who are traveling abroad, who happen to be from the seven Muslim majority countries who are impacted by the travel ban, who could not return to my state, could not return to their state. What's up with that, right? It's un-American, that Muslim travel ban. And our view is unconstitutional as well. And in my view, these cases, like the travel ban, go to core issues of who we, as Americans, are as a people. I think you go down the list on so many of these cases, and there are fundamental aspects um, that relate to our democracy that are at stake. At stake. For example, for the first travel ban case, the president's argument, the Department of Justice's argument on behalf of the president, they argued that they didn't just argue that the president has a lot of authority to issue an executive order, which he does. He's the president. Elections have consequences. They actually argued in their briefing and an oral argument before our federal courts that the president's authority, I'm quoting now from their brief, is unreviewable by the courts. That the president can enact, an act, can enact a law, an executive order like the travel ban, and the courts can't even look at it. That was literally their argument. That's breathtaking, right? We're a democracy. We have separate branches of government. That has never been the law. It is not the law. We sure as hell, we're not gonna allow that to be the law. And we're thankful that the federal courts rejected that argument in that travel ban case. So issues like that, there's a reason why that first travel ban case is already taught in law schools in the United States because it goes to the limits of presidential authority. What are those limits, right? And thankfully in that case, we prevailed. I also want to mention that, you know, that first travel ban case, I'm asked about a lot because it was the first challenge to the president. Um, just a couple weeks after he became president, he signed that first travel ban, uh, that executive order. It was signed on a Friday night. And we were chatting upstairs a little bit about, 
hey, how do we make the decision to file the lawsuit? And my team worked very, very hard. You know, we were all in the office working that weekend, happy to chat about it in more detail, but it was a very intense weekend. And I decided we we're gonna file that lawsuit on Monday. So the executive order signed on Friday and we're gonna try and file a lawsuit Monday, which is a massive body of work, to put it mildly, to put uh, multiple, hundreds of pages of documents, put it together and create the legal arguments. It's a huge challenge. But we put together on Monday, filed that lawsuit Monday. We we're the only state to file it. At that point, no other states were ready to join us. Other states came on board a little bit later on, which we were very appreciative of. And the beauty of our system, I think, in the United States is that as outrageous as the president's actions were in executing that travel ban, we had a hearing before a federal judge that Friday, exactly one week after the travel ban was executed. Judge Robart, a judge appointed by President George W. Bush in my state of Washington, he had a hearing and we were asking for an injunction. We were asking for the judge to put a stop to the trial ban, which was in effect. That's a very difficult hurdle for a lawyer to meet, to go before a federal judge and say, put a stop to whatever action you're opposing, especially if it's something that the president did. Um, but the judge granted that request, which put a stop to the travel ban the moment he signed that order. So in other words, within one week from the president issuing that travel ban, within a week, we'd put a stop to it. And so there's a lot of concerns about this president, which I share on many levels, but I do have faith in our institutions uh, in the United States, the rule of law, a free press. And I do believe that those institutions are stronger than any one person. In a federal courthouse, in a federal courtroom, it is not the loudest voice that prevails. It's not. All a federal judge cares about is your case, the facts of your case, and the law and the Constitution. That is it. You cannot tweet your way out of a problem in a federal courtroom. It doesn't work, right? So it's the great leveler, it's a great playing field. And frankly, all the challenges that many of us see with this president, what he says, how he says it, that comes back to haunt him in a courtroom where a judge will focus on the law and the facts of your case. And I think that is a key reason why we've continued to have success after success, working with other states, with Democratic attorneys general, to have a lot of success on a lot of different issues. Uh, and look forward to chatting about those with all of you today. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Bob. Um, so a quick follow-up question on um, the Muslim ban. So you said that um, you issued, so uh, Trump issued it on Friday and mm -hmm. you had a challenge on Monday. Yeah. Um, and you worked uh, directly with the governor of Washington and other um, companies such as Amazon. Yeah. What role did they play in actually supporting um, the challenge? So a good question. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, my governor in state of Washington, Jay Inslee, fantastic governor. Uh, he's someone I'm close to. And I was thankful that I'm in a state where uh, uh, my governor was supportive of what I want to do. Uh, our system is I don't ask permission from the governor. If I'm going to file a lawsuit on behalf of the people. I can just do that. But of course, I'm calling to give a heads up to the governor. And it helped a lot to know that I had a governor who'd be supportive publicly with our efforts and could help with our case. That was uh, wonderfully helpful. The second point you mentioned, Amazon, Expedia. That weekend, we decided that in trying to craft our argument for the judge, one thing we had to show was that we had standing, we had a dog in the fight to be in front of the courtroom, okay? And it's not always intuitive that the attorney general can bring a lawsuit on behalf of the people, as opposed, let's say, that graduate student who's traveled abroad and cannot come back into her state. Well, she's obviously been harmed, she could bring a lawsuit. It's not always intuitive whether I can bring it. So one thing we have to show is a harm to our state. And so in kicking that around, my solicitor general, Noah Purcell, thought, hey, we should reach out to large entities, businesses in our, in our state, and see if they've filed declarations talking about the harm to those businesses in terms of inability to recruit or folks from those businesses who might be traveling abroad who can't get back in. So literally on Sunday morning that weekend, uh, you know, as early as I thought I could get away with making a phone call, I was calling the corporate counsel for Amazon and Expedia and other businesses in our state and both Amazon and Expedia agreed they would file declarations and they did it by Monday. I mean, they did it the very next day. They moved very, very quickly. And we think that helped make our case. We also want to show many levels the case was about a lot of things. The rule of law, the impact on those individuals, on businesses, on national security, we thought in a negative way. And we were trying to tell all those stories with our filing, with our court papers uh, that Monday. Perfect. Um, so going back to the start of your political career, um, could okay. you talk about your rise uh, to political office, um, including your challenge uh, to the Democratic incumbent uh, who was actually holding the seat on the King County uh, Council for 20 years sure. and how you went about defeating them? Yeah, it's going back a little ways, but, uh, uh, and uh, my sister remember this campaign well. So uh, I was a lawyer practicing law in a law firm in Seattle uh, in my 30s, and I was interested in politics, thought I'd run for office. So I ran for a local office, our county council, 
King County, it's a big county. Uh, it's got a couple million people in it. And uh, I decided to run against a 20 year incumbent who happened to be a Democrat like me, which is not the easiest path into politics as you might imagine. And, uh, and she had the support of the Democratic Party as you might imagine. So it was a grassroots campaign. I took a leave absence from my job at my law firm. I knocked on 22,000 doors. It's what I did every single day for many, many months, just going around knocking on doors. And we were outspent two to one, but you know, we just went out there and talked directly to the people and prevailed. It was a very, very close election, but I was able to win. And I guess what I'll say about that is it was really, I've looked back on it, sort of the perfect way to get into politics because the only people who wrote checks to my campaign were my family members, my friends, my colleagues at work. That was it. There were no PACs. We had no institutional support of any kind at all, period. So when I got elected to office, I didn't really owe anyone anything other than, you know, make sure my family was proud of my work or that my friends felt I was doing a good job, but I didn't owe anyone anything. And there's a lot of great freedom that comes with that. You can make decisions that will anger your friends and supporters sometimes, the institutions, right, the party supporters, but you know you can survive that because I got into office that way. Perfect. Um, so also at the start of your career, you came to see practicing law as a potential for, quote, moral enterprise, a phrase that you have used many times since. Yeah. Uh, could you describe the context in which you started your career uh, when the Cold War was winding down and the general sentiment under Ronald Reagan's administration? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I do think of my work in the law as a moral enterprise. I think of the law oftentimes through a moral lens, uh, in part because, in large part, because I say this to my team all the time, right, that the, the, the law has such a huge impact on people, right? Every case you bring has massive implications. Someone's life is gonna be impacted by that lawsuit. And you have to always remember that. Yes, we have to focus on the law and the constitution, but to tell the stories or to think about the stories of who's gonna be impacted by that. And I think that the law can be used as a great equalizer on behalf of folks who may not have access to justice, access to quality lawyers. There's a fellow here, Rob Costello, who's worked in the Office Attorney General for more than 30 years. He just happens to be here in England and he's visiting here today as well. I and mean, we have folks who, this is what they do and keep that in mind at all times. So I do think of the law in that way. I mean, in terms of my upbringing, yes, Ronald Reagan was president at sort of a formative time as I was, as I was growing up. And, you know, I, I think for me, the primary drivers for how I think about the world uh, came primarily through my family. Um, you know, my sister and I have an uncle, a late uncle, who's a Jesuit priest, very big influence on all the kids in the family. He's very, we're very close to him. And, you know, his, his focus on social justice was, it was very real to our family. Uh, my mother's a special education teacher, long retired now, but taught special education in the public schools. So, you know, she obviously had a perspective that she brought to the dining room table every night. We had family, all those kids about, you know, the challenges other people had. So I think I was raised in an environment that really focused on those kinds of issues. And uh, I think that really helps me in my job. Absolutely. Um, so have, you have stated that uh, your current office uh, is mm -hmm. more consequential than the governorship. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that is the case? I think, I think what I've said is there's no more consequential office uh, in, in government than being attorney general. And so uh, the reason I think that is, number one, it's an executive position, right? Number two, I think the litigation against the Trump administration is an example of how consequential it is. As attorney general, as I mentioned earlier, I don't ask permission to file a lawsuit like that. I think it's the right thing to do. I'm doing it. And there are few positions in politics where you have that level of independence and autonomy on issues of state, national, international significance. And I love that about the job. I mean, I love that about the job. And we have a fantastic team. So, hey, when I say let's take on this travel ban, we have an army of attorneys and professional staff who can make that happen and do it very, very well. And so I think now, you know, I first ran for Attorney General in 2012, when I would say, hey, I think this is the most consequential office in state government, people gave me a funny look, like, well, how can that be? Attorney General, is that some sort of sleepy lawyer? Now when I say that, nobody gives me a funny look, right? They, they, they get how consequential it really is. Absolutely. Um, so you also said that the secret to being a successful lawyer is being a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, the story you have told so far about the Trump administration has resonated across the nation and across the, uh, the world. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you give to those in the audience uh, who are hoping to follow your uh, path and become an attorney? Well, uh, I hope folks do consider that. What I would say is uh, we have a lot of lawyers in the world, which is a good thing, uh, but we don't have nearly enough lawyers who do public service as a, as a career in the law. It is not you know, as lucrative, for sure, than being in private practice, right? But, you know, my Solicitor General, who I mentioned earlier, who did the argument for the trial court and the Ninth Circuit decision on the travel ban, look, he was working at a private law firm, left that to become Solicitor General 
at a fraction of what he would otherwise be making, and he's making a profound difference in that. And the need is so great, right? Like in my country, just the need for folks to have access to the justice system, to know how to navigate that system, to have an advocate who knows what the heck he or she is doing. Oh my God, you know, it's, you know, the courtroom itself can be a level playing field, but you gotta be able to get to the courtroom and have a good advocate. And those are two big steps to get there. So if you're thinking about being a lawyer, which I hope you do consider, consider public service. The, the need is so great uh, in, our, in our society, in our world, and that's what I would, uh, that's what I would encourage folks to do. And uh, it's, I mean, this is not, this is way off topic, but I, I uh, we just live, in, in my country, I, I'll speak about my country, it's such a consumer-driven society, you know, the United States. Uh, and, you know, I just, uh, that's overrated. You know, I, I think the satisfaction that comes with life is helping other people, right? And, and family, and that, that motivates me. And I think that it's easy to lose sight of that, I think, in the United States with just all the communication that comes down. You need to make money, have a big house, tr get a new car. That stuff, I, it doesn't move me. I, I just, it's not, it doesn't matter to me. I, I just don't think it's important. As a follow-up question, so one of your main focuses as Attorney General is to increase consumer protection, yeah. um, having doubled the size of the consumer Triple protection. Now. Triple, Triple now. Triple now, yeah. Uh, could you reflect on the necessity of protecting consumers' rights and whether the billion-dollar uh, corporations that violate the law have become too powerful? Yeah, so just so folks know, consumer protection, uh, it is what it sounds like, right? That if consumers are being taken advantage of in the marketplace, someone's not playing by the rules, we can bring a lawsuit against we have a big one against Comcast right now, right, for unfair billing. We can sue Comcast on behalf of the people of the state of Washington. When we're successful, we can return dollars to people who lost out unfairly on dollars. So uh, it's a very powerful tool that all AGs have. Um, I think the big tobacco litigation against tobacco company many years ago, those were state AGs, including one of my predecessors, Chris Gregoire, sued the tobacco companies. Billions of dollars were in that settlement. Massive, massive case. So. I've enlarged our consumer protection division dramatically because, look, oftentimes powerful interests do not play by the rules. And the average Washingtonian in my state does not have the resources to sue Comcast, right? I'm using them as an example, right? But there are many others, right? To take on that powerful entity, how do you do it? Well, that's why we have a team in our office who can do it on behalf of the people of the state of Washington. What I felt when I became attorney general, as Rob well knows, is that I did not think we had a big enough team to take on those big complex cases that can drag out for years and have a multi-week trial. We just didn't have it. Great people, but it wasn't big enough. So I've grown that operation so we can take on big, complex cases that can have huge impact, not just in our state, but around the country as well. Absolutely. So the DACA, which stands for uh, Deferred Action for Childhood yeah. Arrivals, is another Obama-era policy that has been under threat during uh, the Trump administration. Could uh, you talk about this legal challenge from your perspective? Yeah, so as most of you probably know, um, we refer to the folks under the DACA program as dreamers. Uh, there's about 800,000 dreamers in the United States. These are individuals who were brought to the United States as children, as little kids, by their parents. Their parents came into the country illegally and brought their children with them. So they've grown up in the United States. The United States is the only country these kids have ever known. Uh, they are as American as I am in every respect. Um, and so President Obama created this DACA program that allowed these 800,000 individuals to live, work, go to school in the United States without risk of being deported. President Trump, uh, now I guess uh, a number of months ago, said he would rescind that program effective March 5th, a couple months ago, uh, unless Congress acted, which they have not. Um, I, along with other AGs, filed a lawsuit the next day challenging that decision, saying that that was unlawful, he didn't have that authority to do in the way that he executed it. Uh, and we've been successful. Federal trial court judge agreed with us. So the reason why the DACA program is still in effect is because of the lawsuit. Uh, had not been for that, those individuals couldn't be deported. And I'll just add one thing. I mentioned earlier at my outset about how these cases matter for the individuals. Well, this is pretty fundamental, right? Whether those 800,000 people can live in the United States or be deported to a country they do not know, right? They may not speak the language. They don't know anybody. That's what's at stake for those folks. But also, just to be clear, in order to become a dreamer, you have to come out of the shadows. Say who you are, where you live, where you go to school, where you work who your family members are, they, or may not be, they may or may not be in the country legally. So you have to come out of the shadows and provide this information voluntarily to the federal government, which has the power to deport you, right? That's the first step before you qualify for it. The federal government has promised they would never use that information against those individuals to deport them. In fact, there's even a website from the federal government that has a frequently asked questions. One of the questions is, will this information ever be used against me? Answer, no. On the day that the president announced the rescission of that DACA program, that question and that answer on that website was removed. What's up with that? 
right? It isn't a deal a deal. You make a promise, someone comes out of the shadows, provides all this information, and then the day you announce it, you say, nope, didn't really mean it. Look, that is fundamental to us as a people in America, right? You teach your children a deal's a deal. My son, Jack, he's 10, he's into Pokemon cards, right? Are Pokemon cards a thing here? I don't know if they are or not, but he's into Pokemon <laughs> cards. I don't know if they're, if they're international or not, but uh, he likes to trade them with his buddies. So he and his buddy, Elliot, they trade Pokemon cards. If Jack comes to me one day and says, hey, daddy, I realize I traded a very valuable Pokemon card for one that's not very valuable. We've got to go back up to Elliot's house and undo the deal. What am I going to say to him? Sorry, Jack, you made a deal. You may not like the deal now, I get that, but you made a deal, you got to stick to that deal. It's basic, it's what we teach as parents. Well, the United States made a deal and we're not talking Pokemon cards, right? So what's at stake again? Yes, there's legal arguments, sometimes obscure legal arguments, but what's at stake, goes so, what's at stake is so much more fundamental than that, right? It's about who, in my view, who we are in my country as a people, and that's why these lawsuits are so important to me and to a lot of people. Um, what do you think is going to come next uh, in the growing list of legal battles against the Trump administration? That's a tricky question. Uh, well, look, if we were having this conversation a year ago, maybe after the first trial ban case, if you'd said, hey, Bob, do you think you're going to file 25 more lawsuits? I would have laughed. Like, that was not on the radar. That was not part of any plan. That So it's I've learned to not anticipate or to, you know, it's, it's just hard to predict. That said, there's nothing about this administration that suggests to me that they are changing course in terms of issuing out executive orders and laws that are unconstitutional and unlawful and that need to be challenged. I just don't see any slowing down. If anything, it's, it's almost accelerating. So I suspect if we're here talking in a year or you're checking in a year that I assume we'll have more lawsuits that will be filed, but it's really up to the administration, not to me, right? It's up to them. You know, a nine cases, nine and speaks for itself, right? Um, they need to get their act together uh, from a legal standpoint, and they just haven't done that at this point. Absolutely. Um, so let's now talk a little bit about domestic politics. Yeah. Uh, what are your predictions for the upcoming midterm elections? Um, and do you think the Democrats have a, a strong chance of regaining a majority? I think so. I'm not an expert on this, right? We're, we're leaving an area I know very well to one I obviously follow very closely, but I don't pretend to be an expert. But, uh, uh, but the information that I hear, from folks in my state as I talk to other AGs around the country and what they're seeing on the ground in their states, you know, the reports of a blue wave, a democratic wave, I, I think that's real. I've talked in my state to Republicans who I trust their political judgment and they think it's a big blue wave coming. And I think that's what we'll see at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. Is it enough to retake Congress? I, you know, I, I'm not crunching on the level of detail district by district to know the answer to that, but uh, you see the retirements of Republican officials in Congress and in my state legislature, left and right, that speaks volumes, right? That, that they see what's coming. And so I would be very surprised if there was not a significant blue wave at all those levels, local, state, national, just how big a wave it is. It's a long time between now and the elections, so a lot can happen. Uh, but where it stands right now, that's what I see coming. Absolutely. Um, so you're also a prominent uh, environmental defender mm -hmm. uh, in a country where a significant proportion of the population does not believe in climate change, mm -hmm. uh, and in particular Republican uh, lawmakers. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's po possible to change that mentality? And could you talk about what you have been doing as Attorney General uh, to ensure the U.S. government and Washington state uh, protects our environment? The first question is tougher in terms of how to change that mentality. I, I'm not sure, honestly, I have a, an answer to that because the facts are the facts are the facts on climate change, and if folks don't want to recognize that, that human beings are a significant contributor to that, I'm not sure what I or you or anyone can say, right? Um, I think the only thing that may change that is when people start feeling the effects that we're starting to see around the world, but when they personally start to feel that or their loved ones start to experience that. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of what my office is doing, I mean, I'll keep this relatively short, but of those 26 lawsuits that we have filed against the administration, I'm sure half of those, I would guess 13, are related to environmental issues. I won't go through them all or even any of them, but what I can tell you is that um, many of these go against uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, headed by Scott Pruitt, um, a former Attorney General from the state of Oklahoma, who as Attorney General of Oklahoma, filed many lawsuits against the EPA trying to roll back environmental protections when President Obama was president. So there has been, I think it's fair to say, a systemic effort by the Trump administration, particularly with Scott Pruitt, to roll back as many Obama-era environmental protections as possible. Mm -hmm. So about half our lawsuits have been related to those kinds of issues. The good news for us is we keep beating them in court because they're in such a hurry to do this that they are candidly sloppy, 
right? There are certain things you must do to change policies. You don't just get to sign your name. You've got to go through, take certain steps. You've got to have public comment. You've got to do an analysis of it. You've got to do these things. And over and over, they refuse to do that. And that has allowed us to be successful in challenging numerous environmental uh, attempts to roll back environmental protections. But these are significant from climate change, um, uh, which has obviously significance around, significance around our world. So we'll see how it plays out, but I see no change in the way they roll out these changes in policy. So I think you'll see more. In fact, we just filed a lawsuit in the last 48 hours on a significant case on vehicle emission standards put in place by the Obama administration, which will have a huge impact uh, on our environment and climate change. They're attempting to roll those back. We think we'll be successful in that case as well. Absolutely. So my final question mm -hmm. before we open up to the audience. Yeah. Um, so given the ongoing um, investigations on uh, Russian interference, yeah. do you think a Trump impeachment process is on the horizon or is it too early to tell? For me, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. That's the short answer. I, you know, my life is pretty full with my day job and the work we have against Trump administration um, and, and with my wife raising young children. So I'm, of course, interested in what Robert Mueller is doing. And I read newspaper articles about it, but I have no inside information, have no idea where that's going to go. Um, and uh, we'll be interested, in see, I mean, he's a serious guy, and uh, I would not want to be the target of his investigation, I'll tell you that. And so we'll see where it plays out. But I think too soon to today, and uh, only a handful of people know where that's going, and they're not talking. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so now it's a good time to open up to Great. the audience. Um, if Great. you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you um, and stand up before you ask your question. So we can start with the gentleman in the second row. Um, you've spoken briefly about uh, the challenges that uh, people face to access justice, mm -hmm. basically. So um, I I'm an outsider to this uh, whole legal profession. Sure. Um, what are some of the sort of greatest challenges that people are perhaps not aware of? You bet. So in speaking about the United States, for example, uh, there are folks who simply do not have the financial resources to hire an attorney to represent them. Uh, they may not speak English and have no idea how to navigate a complex judicial system. They may not be in the country legally. They're entitled to consumer protection protections, for example, right? But they may not be very comfortable calling up the attorney general if they're not in our country legally to say they've been the target of a scam, for example. So there are all sorts of challenges just to access the court system in a fair way. And that's why the important role of the attorney general in the United States really comes in on issues like consumer protection, civil rights enforcement, that we have the resources, we have the ability to bring those cases on behalf of people and bring justice to them. That said, there are huge challenges in my state and every state in the country with what we call these access to justice challenges that many millions of people have in our country. Thank you. Um, so next question, we'll go to the gentleman in the second row. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, so I think it was a couple weeks ago the Supreme Court uh, heard arguments regarding the Trump travel ban. I yeah. think it's like Trump versus Hawaii. <laughs> yes. Um, so like d for either contingency, whether it goes one way or the other, what's your plan or your plan of action regarding the decision, what you plan to do afterwards? Yeah, good, good question. I'm glad you asked because the travel ban litigation is complicated. So I'll give you the 30 second summary. So there have been, I think now three different travel bans if I've got my count right. So Wash, the, the case I talked about was the original travel ban, right? We won the trial court, Ninth Circuit, they did not appeal the Supreme Court. They had to rescind that first travel ban, right? Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, for what it's worth, I, I did tell my legal team to ask the court to have the federal government pay our costs for having to respond to their appeal. It was, they told me it's not going to be very much money. I said, that's not the point. I, I want the federal government to write a check to the state of Washington, the people of the state of Washington, for whatever amount of money it is. Um, I want to make that point. I won't confirm or deny whether that check is framed in my office, by the way, because since we're on TV, I won't, I won't confirm or deny that. But that was, a, that was important to me. Uh, there have been successive travel bans, each one trying to narrow it a bit more to meet a constitutional muster, basically. Um, we challenged those other ones, but now other states were challenging as well, including Hawaii. So when we were literally in court on the other travel bans, a federal judge in Hawaii granted the state of Hawaii's request for an injunction. So that's the case that went forward, not ours. So we're not, the state of Washington is not the party in that case, it's the state of Hawaii. What I can say is that, you know, we obviously followed the oral argument at the Supreme Court pretty closely. Reports of, now you can't read too much into oral arguments, but um, most folks, most observers felt that there seemed to be a majority of the US Supreme Court that appeared willing to issue a holding that would uphold most, if not all, of the travel ban. But who knows, right? You can read too much into an oral argument. To your question of you know, what a next step would be for us, so much depends on what that ruling looks like. 
let's assume prepare for the worst. Let's say it's a bad decision from my perspective that allows some part of that to go forward or all of it to go forward. How broadly is that written? What does that mean for my state, for the people of my state? A lot will depend on how the court crafts that decision. So it'd be hard to speculate on what that means. Uh, it could be then the road. It could just be, hey, the trial ban is constitutional. There really isn't any more way to challenge that. There may be some details for individuals that have to be worked out, but from a large sense, the role of my office may be relatively limited. Once the Supreme Court has spoken, they've spoken, but so much would depend on their ruling and how they write it is obviously very important. But we'd expect a decision in the next couple months on that. Thank you. Um, actually, as a follow-up question, yeah. um, upstairs we were talking about uh, your relationship with the U.S. Attorney General yeah. Jeff Sessions. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, uh, because you clearly have you know, such opposing views, how the working relationship has been? Uh, right. I guess, uh, um, uh, I mean, there really is, I regret to say there's not really a working relationship. I I've asked after he became Attorney General, I've made repeated requests for a meeting with the Attorney General. Uh, to talk about things like marijuana legalization. In my state of Washington, Washington, Colorado, were the first two states to legalize marijuana back in 2012. Um, we met with er Eric Holder, Attorney General for Barack Obama, right after we, uh, the governor and I came into office to talk about marijuana legalization. We made the same request for uh, Attorney General Sessions. He's made it clear he doesn't have any interest in meeting with us, which I think is very disappointing. Um, I get that he and I have very different ideas around the legalization of marijuana, but you know, in, in my line of work, I am frequently meeting with folks who have different views than I do about the law or about policies, but you know, folks may be often surprised how much common ground you can find or at least agree on what the facts are about your dispute, which is important. So frustration I have had is that we have not had that meeting. As a result, I think his ideas of legalization in the United States and in my state in particular, he's just wrong on key facts. He wrote a lengthy letter to me and the governor, um, for example, uh, earlier this year or last year, I think it was a long letter criticizing our system, right? And relying on a report that was issued back in 2013 or 2014. His first criticism in this letter to me was, hey, Ferguson, you guys haven't brought together your medical marijuana system and your recreational marijuana system into one unified system, and that's a problem. There's just one problem with that. After that report came out, but before he sent me that letter, our state legislature had done exactly that. A 30 second Google search would have turned it up. I'm not, we've done exactly what he told us to do, but we've done it long before he wrote the letter. Well, you know, uh, it's hard to have a, I mean, I'm just, I'm, it's a hard thing to say, but it, it's hard to have a serious conversation. It's hard to take someone seriously if that's what they're gonna write in a letter to me, right? Um, so we had to write a letter back saying, hey, yeah, no, we already did that, it was a while ago. You know, that report's outdated, there's been a new report. And so it's a challenge, not just because we have different ideas, right, but because it's a hard thing to say, but I don't think he's especially interested in knowing what the facts are about marijuana legalization in my state. I, he's, just, he's just not. His actions demonstrate that. And uh, that's a hard thing to say about someone, but it, it's true. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, we'll go to the gentleman in the fourth row. Uh, we recently uh, wrote an article suggesting that insurance companies should collect a carbon levy Sorry, uh, I missed that. I missed that. that insurance companies should collect a carbon levy. Uh, it was a comment published in Nature. <laughs> now, the way our thinking was going was that a successful litigation against climate change was a matter of when, mm -hmm. um, not, not if. Mm -hmm. And we were sort of imagining that some form of out-of-court settlement might be um, agreed at to avoid you know, chaos mm -hmm. uh, in terms of legal action and, and uh, plummets in, in share prices and the mm -hmm. like. And I just wondered what your views were on this, whether you thought that was realistic, and if so, what the timings might be and what form that might take. And, and realistic in terms of sort of the legal challenges that are going on, or in terms of? Yeah, whether, whether a, re uh, a legal challenge is, in your view, likely to be successful in the near, near term. Yeah, I've got, be a little, yeah I've got to be a little careful about this because uh, uh, you know, I'm the Attorney General. I give legal advice to our clients in state government, the governor, and sometimes we talk about issues that are raised, and I've got to be a little careful in how I answer them. So if I'm a little evasive, my apologies, but um, uh, we have attorney-client privileges with, with our clients. So I think what I can say is that we talked about Governor Jay Inslee, the governor of my state, uh, a wonderful governor. He is intensely interested in climate change. Uh, he's proposed carbon taxes, for example, in our state, but he's very, very focused on this issue. Um, and uh, we've had conversations around the issues you're, you are raising. There have been some jurisdictions that have brought these major legal challenges um, based on a climate change argument, public nuisance type argument. So those are just getting started in the courts. So I don't think I'm, I can or should say what I think about those just because 
I may have a role in my state and representing clients. I just got to be careful about that. But I think those challenges are interesting. Um, uh, I've had conversations with my team about those, but I, I probably shouldn't just give you an actual assessment of what I think about those. Other than I think you will see more and more jurisdictions bringing those legal challenges. So in a similar way, we, I mentioned these tobacco cases that were back in the 1980s, if I've got my decades right, where AGs brought numerous challenges against tobacco companies and resulted in a massive, I mean, many, many billions of dollars. I, I think this has that kind of potential to be litigation on that scale and that magnitude. Uh, I think that's possible. Thank you. Um, next question. We'll go to the hand all the way in the back. Thank you. Do you think Schneiderman's departure from the New York Attorney General post will change the nature of investigations into Trump, uh, Russian collusion, and fraud more generally? And uh, who do you think is likely to take over from him? Um, so first, I'm just with Eric Schneiderman. I, I guess I just want to, I think I just want to first say that, you know, I obviously read about, I was up in the middle of the night, a little jet lag still, and so I, I read about it. And, uh, you know, at first, I guess what I want to say is that for those women to come forward, to speak out against the attorney general of their state, the top law enforcement of their state, who, according to their allegations, threatened them if they came forward, you know, takes a level of guts that's, you know, it says a lot about them uh, to their great credit. Um, so setting aside the human side of this, I mean, you're sort of getting to, hey, what, what's next on, on the legal side? Um, I've not had a lot of time to think about that, but I've thought about it a little bit. And it's, uh, I'm confident that the work of that office and we work very closely with the New York AG's office, very, very closely with them. Um, I do not think you're gonna see a change in their work product, their commitment to these issues. I don't think that's gonna change simply because uh, there's a new leader that's gonna come in. And uh, I, I feel pretty confident about that. I will say that you know, there are multiple states who now bring these different lawsuits we were talking about. It is a team effort amongst many Democratic AG's. Um, some states obviously have more resources than others, but when you talk about New York, that is an office that has considerable resources, uh, that's been a real leader on some of these cases that we've worked very, very closely with. So they are a, they are a critical component to a lot of the work that we're talking about here tonight. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to uh, the gentleman just in the back as well. Hi, thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you thought or if you wished that um, there was something that citizens would do um, which, which would help with your work or if they're kind of just out of the picture once you mm -hmm. kind of carry on with your work. It's interesting. What citizens would it help with our work? I, it's a good question. I, I think what I would say is that, um, I think what I would say is that, you know, uh, in the United States with this president, wherever one falls on the political spectrum, right? Uh, but what I sometimes say to people and when I give a talk in the United States is, it is no time to be on the sidelines. Everybody has a different role they can play. I thank God every day I'm the Attorney General, right? I, I do, and that I have the tools that I have. I thank God every day that I have the job that I have. Um, but everybody's got a tool, right? The Women's March, right, uh, in the United States. The protests at the airports when the travel ban came down. Look, I, that helped put a focus on the human, right, the human aspect of that outrageous executive order in a way that I sure as heck can as an attorney general, right? I mean, that was on the news all the time, international, right? And, and so whether it's running for office or attending a rally or writing a letter to your elected official or you're a lawyer and you can go to that airport and help folks who are trying to come in, you get the idea. It's just not a time to be on the sidelines. Wherever one is on the political spectrum, I just think it's, it's that crucial a time right now. And, and uh, so I think that's what I would say is that whatever form that takes, Everybody's personality is different, every skill set is different, but there's something everybody can do if they care about these issues. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to um, the gentleman in the fourth row. Thanks very much. Uh, so it's um, more of a normative question, kind of following back on the uh, travel ban issue. Yeah. So, so, so lots of the terms you refer to kind of reflected on the the fact uh, that this, this wasn't constitutional mm -hmm. or wasn't American. And generally the framing of the discussion wasn't so much about how it flouts international law, specifically international refugee law, mm -hmm. uh, but rather how it flouts American constitutional law. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think that kind of cultural um, uh, or, or culture, legal culture in which the references are not to America as, as part of an international community, but to America as, as having its own self-contained legal system, uh, is that something that could, is susceptible to change, could change, should change? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's uh, what I would say is that on cases like the travel ban, um, I, my team, we were acutely aware of the international ramifications of that case um, and the impacts of people around the world in that case. Um, but I've got to craft a legal argument that's going to work, right? That's our job. And in showing standing, for example, I've got to show harm to Washingtonians, people in my state. And so we are laser focused on that. Now that said, um, uh, after the, we were successful with that first travel ban, uh, you know, I started getting some letters came into my office, not emails, you know, people handwritten letters. And they came from people all over the world. Uh, which is a reminder to us of the international significance of what's going on, right? Um, but in terms of whether it's ch some change in our court system, I don't think you're going to see some sort of change in the norms or how we, right, how we do those cases. But that said, I think it is a reminder of, when I, I often say the law is a powerful thing, and it is such a powerful tool, and it can have an impact, not just in our small state in Washington State, which is a state I, I love deeply, but can have these international ramifications. I run into people, you know, almost every day who say, hey, I'm from one of those seven Muslim majority countries. My grandmother was allowed to come be reunited with her family or I was able to marry the person I love because, I mean, I'm not really exaggerating. I say that's almost a daily experience for me in the last year. So we're cognizant of that. I just don't think you're gonna see it sort of some change in the legal system. But that's it, we're aware of that. And, uh, and I, it, gives me, it gives great meaning to that case. I'll, I'll say that, yeah. Okay. Um, as a follow-up question, yeah. um, so a question about LGBTQ rights. Yeah. Um, and the US. Uh, so you formed the Wing Luke Civil Rights mm -hmm. Unit in the Washington Attorney General's office mm -hmm. and personally argued the Arlen's Flower case before, uh, before the Washington Supreme Court. Uh, for those of no in the audience that don't know about it, sure. could you describe um, the circumstances of that case, what the outcome was, and more generally, uh, what do you think uh, can be done to improve LGBTQ rights in the US? Yeah, so uh, this was a big case in my state and it now has a virtually identical case has been argued at the US Supreme Court. So you're gonna be seeing a decision from the US Supreme Court on this issue I'll describe here in the next month or two. Um, so in my state, this is a few years ago, uh, a man went into a flower shop um, to buy flowers for his upcoming wedding to his longtime same-sex partner. Um, he went to the floor shop he's always gone to. They've always served him. When he went in, when the owner of the store realized the flowers were going to be for a gay wedding, she said, I'm sorry, I can't sell you those flowers. And when he asked why not, she said, well, I'm opposed to gay marriage. I have a religious opposition to it. So uh, under Washington state law, um, you cannot discriminate against someone on the basis of things that are obvious, race, religion, age, gender, but also you cannot discriminate against someone in a consumer setting uh, on the base of their sexual orientation, which in my view was pretty clearly what this was. So I filed a lawsuit against that business, controversial lawsuit, certainly at the time I filed it. Um, and we prevailed at the trial court, went to the state Supreme Court. I did decide to argue that personally before the state Supreme Court, we prevailed 9-0. Now I wanna be clear, if you treat everybody the same, if you don't sell wedding flowers at all, you don't have to sell to a gay couple, okay? But if you sell flowers, to heterosexual couples, you've got to sell them to a gay couple, okay? You have to sell any particular product in your store, but once you sell it, you can't discriminate at that point, okay? Um, now, a very similar case came out of Colorado. There are a handful of cases like this. One came out of Colorado, it was a bakery case, okay? Virtually identical situation. The Supreme Court took that case. Could have easily been ours, but they took that one. That went to the Supreme Court. I was at that oral argument and, you know, uh, one thing I just will say without getting too much in the weeds, I hope, is that up until then, there have been some cases like this and the US Supreme Court had declined to accept those cases for review, which in other words, they're communicating they're good with those lower court decisions, basically. But they chose to take this Baker case. The only difference is Neil Gorsuch is on the Supreme Court, wasn't before. So there's been a slight change in the makeup of the Supreme Court, but that did come as a surprise that they took the case, they've had the oral argument. No one knows which way it's gonna go, but that case could have significant ramifications on whether LGBT individuals are treated fairly in the marketplace. I mean, just to be clear, if someone has a religious opposition, right, what the argument is that they could decline service to a gay person simply because they're opposed to gay marriage, for example. That would be, uh, you know, I, I can't express how disappointing and not wrong. I, if the Supreme Court rules in favor, favor of this, Baker, I guarantee you 
in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, the US Supreme Court will write, decisions, will write a decision saying, we got that one wrong. We regret that. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. Um, I just hope it doesn't come to that. But I, I guarantee it. It's just, it's not, it's not right and it's not constitutional. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next question. We'll go to uh, the hand just there on the right. To you, on the white side. Uh, so last month, a Supreme Court ruling came out where uh, Judge Gorsuch uh, actually sided with the liberals on the bench uh, instead of with expected as with his fellow conservatives. Do you think that this is something that might continue in the future, especially on immigration law? Or do you think that uh, he's going to sort of have a more liberal impact on the court going forward? I think it's too soon to say. We watch the justices pretty closely, as you might imagine, in my office. Um, but one thing I, I, I would emphasize is that sometimes, sometimes folks can overemphasize this justice is conservative, this justice is liberal, this justice is done. Uh, and a good example is the first trial ban case, right? Everybody thought Trump would appeal that to the U.S. Supreme Court after we won the Ninth Circuit. Ninth Circuit, right? If Trump loves to rail on the Ninth Circuit, how it's this liberal court, right? They did not appeal it. Well, I'll tell you why they didn't appeal it. They would have lost, okay? Guaranteed, right? They would have lost. It wasn't about conservative liberals, it's about the Constitution laws. Now, I'm not suggesting there aren't orientations of justice. Of course there are. But I think it can be overstated. And, uh, but that said, do I have concerns about, um, you know, the future of the court with President Trump making appointments with the Republican Senate? Yes, uh, I do. Um, but for Justice Gorsuch, it's early in his, in his career. Um, we have a big case uh, before him right now that was recently argued where you know, we're not sure where he's going to go, for example, right? By his questions, he may take a somewhat unexpected position or he may, who knows, right? That it's, uh, so, uh, so we'll see. It's just a little bit too early on, I think, to, 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 to pigeonhole him one way or the other. And often it's, hey, one may be conserved just on certain issues, but others, right, they're more independent or even more leaning on the left. So I think, it's, I think sometimes it's easy to try and pigeonhole justices or AGs or anyone else, and, you know, and, uh, and it doesn't always fit. Can I ask a follow-up? Yeah, absolutely. Would you support, if the Democrats retake the Senate, uh, placing a moratorium on confirming Trump appointees to the bench? Oh, that's good. I guess I hadn't thought about that. Uh, well, I, I certainly hope the Democrats take control of the Senate. That would, uh, that would be wonderful from my perspective. Uh, I don't know. I guess uh, what, what I can say is the, the holdup by the Republicans, right, of President Obama's appointment was, you know, pure... I mean, outrageous politics, right, in my term, in my, my perspective. So, hey, do two wrongs make a right? You know, where in Trump's term is this? Is it the same time period as President Obama's appointment, right, Merrick Garland? Then maybe turnabout's fair play, right? Can that be sustained, sustained for a couple of years? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I guess what I would just say is, uh, you know, it's, it's, to me it was so disappointing that for such an important appointment, Right, that that became so politicized. I get that these things are political, right? I'm not naive, I get it. But that that position, that appointment, the ninth justice, was so politicized. They were not, not gonna interview the guy. We're just not, just not gonna do it. Uh, that was deeply disappointing. And uh, um, yeah, but I think a lot would depend on the timing of when all that happened. But, but that, that, that next appointment will be extremely important, to put it mildly. And it, it might depend on who that person is as well. I'd want who is the appointment that comes, that comes forward. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so we'll go to the lady in the second row. Uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the future and um, integrity of the APA and whether or not you think mm -hmm. that the damage um, mm -hmm. um, the damage of the new environmental policies are um, is considered reversible um, for the for especially for impoverished communities that are being mm -hmm. affected by all the new policies. Uh, the challenges with the EPA right now are significant. Um, if I had to even, you, know, you never want to pick like the one agency where you have the most concerns, it's always a dangerous game, right? But with what I see with the EPA is especially concerning to me. It's why we've had so much litigation, frankly, against the EPA. Um, do I think, to your question directly, do I think it's irreversible? No, uh, especially if Donald Trump's a one-term president, okay? It just takes a long time to put something in effect, survive the court challenges, which they're not doing a very good job of right now, frankly, right? Survive all that and actually get those things implemented. It takes a long time. I've learned a lot about this process. So now if you have a two-term Trump administration, there's a lot more time for, us, for them to correct their mistakes, potentially survive legal challenges and put in changes that could be very, very difficult to unwind. So part of it is political, right? Who's gonna be president in 2020. Um, but the good news is on some of the especially outrageous things they've tried to do, the courts have blocked them so far. 
or they're tied up in the courts right now. And, uh, and that's why we're very focused on those cases. So right now, I don't want to say I'm optimistic. I, I get the challenges, but, uh, but no, I don't think they're irreversible at this time. But a lot will depend on how long they have to run the EPA. Thank you. We have time for one final question. All right, um, the last so one. We'll go to the hand. Uh, Um, this sort of follows on from the question that you just had. Um, and also I was wondering about when you said a deal's a deal, uh, with reference yeah. to people who are welcomed into the, well, were brought to the United States and then have lived there for their entire lives, having been brought in by parents who entered as legal immigrants. Um, and I absolutely agree that those people deserve protection, but I'd be interested to hear, firstly, what you think of in terms of how far that precedent should go. Um, so what interests you think are sufficiently important uh, to justify uh, departure f or preventing a policy change and then also what you actually think of in terms of legal actors preventing pol policy changes which naturally are part of the natural political process um, and so would ordinarily be allowed short of being very unconstitutional. So um, so give me that, can you give me, sorry if you might give me that first question one more time just to make sure I've, I understand it correctly. So I'd be interested to hear what interests you think it is or are sufficiently important to justify preventing a policy change I see. So, in terms of what justifies my challenge to that, in other words, is that the yeah? And yeah. when you think that's legitimate um, for legal sure. actors to step in, despite the fact that an elected government is taking that action? Sure. So, I guess the interesting. I'll focus on that first one. Happy to chat afterwards on, on the second piece you have as well. Um, but the first one's important. It's uh, presidents who have a lot of authority. As I mentioned before, elections have consequences. Every day, there's something the president does where I meet with my team, and I think it's outrageous. But we do not have a legal argument against it. So I don't challenge it. That's up to Congress and right to, to work that out. So we stay very focused on what he does that we think is unlawful. The president's power is not unlimited, as I talked about earlier. So taking Dreamers as an example, um, we have a variety of claims, but I'll just give you maybe two examples of why I think it's important to bring in what those arguments are. So one is that you, I believe that the president took this action um, with a racial animus uh, towards, in this case, Predominantly, dreamers come from Mexico, for example. Um, and he has had many statements about his view of Mexicans uh, that have been made public. A question I've asked is if the major overwhelming majority of dreamers were from Norway, if they were Caucasian, would he have taken that action to say dreamers can't stay in the country? I know the answer to that question. No, he would not have. And it's appropriate for courts to look at the motivation behind any decision made by anybody by me, by a business executive, even by the president. He's got to follow those rules as well. Number two, you go from sort of critical constitutional issues like that, right, uh, to what may be more mundane, but uh, always risky to mention something called the Administrative Procedure Act to any audience. It'll put them right to sleep, but I'll give an attempt on my last question here. So we have something called the Administrative Procedure Act. When Barack Obama was president and Republican AGs were challenging him left and right, okay, on what he had done, he adopted a significant immigration policy that was challenged by Republican AGs. The reason why President Obama's executive action on immigration to essentially expand it was struck down by the courts was not some big constitutional argument. It was because of a challenge on this thing called the Administrative Procedure Act, okay? So even President Obama has felt this challenge, right? How that works. And what it is is basically with my 10-year-old twins, if they're doing their math homework, right? And they're doing fractions or multiplication, there's a white space to the right of their page. And that white space over there is something to show their work of how they got to that answer. So I know they didn't just pick up my iPhone and punch it in and write down the answer. They have to show their work on how they got that solution. Well, it's the same thing with the federal government. They can change policies from previous administrations, but they have to show their work. They have to have a public comment. They have to do an analysis. What's the pro and con to this? What's the impact on businesses if we change protections for dreamers and businesses lose these dreamers as employees? There are steps they must take. They can't just unilaterally wake up one day and say, you know what, we don't like this anymore. And th that's an important principle. There's not. Uh, arbitrary actions by the federal government to have a huge impact on people in the country. And that is a specific act that they violate over and over again. And we think that's the case with rescinding protections for dreamers. So you go from what might seem like the mundane, but we have these rules for a reason, everybody's got to follow them, to really core constitutional issues. And all these cases, you see a blending of these issues coming to the fore. And, and, uh, and that's why I think you'll see with that dreamers case as we go forward as well. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But if you'd like to continue the conversation, please join us in the members bar for a drink. But please join me in thanking Bob Ferguson for joining us today. Thank you.